welcome to the Croncast, a division of the Chronicle and IMI. We hope you'll enjoy today's podcast episode, and if you do, please be sure to leave a like and share it around. Also, be sure to follow us in our social medias, which will be linked in the description box below. Hey guys, welcome to the Croncast. I'm your host, Aditya Tiag, and today I'm with a guest, Lydia Lisko. Lydia, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. Are you doing anything fun over winter break? Well, the day, our last day, I'm going to go see Spider-Man No Way Home. I'm very excited. I've been waiting for this movie since, like, before it was announced. Yeah, no, I, I remember when they first announced that Spider-Man was going to be in the MCU like way back in like 2015 2016 it was like a pipe dream of mine because like seeing spider-man fight along the avengers was just like i didn't think it was ever going to happen but like in 2016 we got it with like civil war and i thought that was like the perfect introduction to his character yeah i because i mean especially from like the toby Maguire spider mans and the andrew garfield like we already knew like how he got bit we didn't even see another reiteration so the fact that he was just like like here's spider-man i'm like yes <laughs> I'm like yes i'm so ready and like when he first stole cap shield in civil war i was like ah! <laughs> no, so and I'm so glad that you brought up the fact that we don't need to see it again. I feel like one thing the MCU did really well back then, especially, was they were self-aware about their target audience. They knew everybody walking into this movie had already probably seen yeah, Spider-Man. Yeah, already know who Spider-Man is. Yeah, so we don't need to see like Uncle Ben getting killed. We don't need to see him being bit by the spider. And I think that's something they did carry pretty well into Homecoming. What were your thoughts on that movie? Homecoming was okay. I mean, I didn't like Vulture as a villain. He was just like, okay. But I mean, it was so obvious that he was her dad. But like, but that scene in the car when he first, that gave me a little bit of a chill. I was like, did he really just pull a gun on a 16 year old? I was like, okay. (laughs) But it was okay. I think it was a good Spider-Man movie. But it just wasn't one of my personal favorites. That's valid. Me personally, I find it interesting that you didn't like Vulture as much. Could uh, could you expand a little bit on why you didn't feel him as maybe menacing as a villain? I don't know. He was just too old. <laughs> 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 I see this dad and I'm like, is this dad really like a criminal mastermind? Like, I, I get his understanding. Oh, the Avengers ruined my career. I have to make a money selling what we- I have to make a living selling weapons now. And I'm like, okay, you and every other age, like average criminal. And I think I feel like a part of the reason they made him like such an average character is I think it's cool to see his arc of being like just an ordinary villain ordinary human being turned villain yeah. and juxtaposing it with someone like peter who's just your friendly neighborhood Neighbor spider-man, Spider-Man. Yeah. like that was a very good con like they had very parallel arcs in that sense to me so i really appreciated it i also am a huge fan of michael keaton yeah. i thought he absolutely <laughs> killed it in the role so no like he was he was a good actor i just like didn't feel it as much i mean it was it was okay like but then, okay, but then again, that scene when he dropped Peter in the lake, that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> I was, again, not expecting it. I feel like he did a lot of out-of-pocket things that <laughs> made me be like, what? Just like, but I don't know. His ending was kind of just meh. I'm glad that they kept him alive, though, because a lot of these movies, you'll see, they'll do like the one and done where the villain gets killed at yeah. the end of the movie. Yeah. So I think it's cool that we might have him back in like a potential sequel, because they did, uh, Tom Holland did confirm that they're doing another trilogy of movies for his Spider-Man character after No Way Home. Okay. So I hope we get to see him back in one of those at least. And like you mentioned earlier, like that scene where Vulture drops Spider-Man um, in the lake, that's super funny, yeah. it's super <laughs> random. But like he gets carried back out um, by Iron Man. And honestly, I think Iron Man is my biggest problem with Homecoming. I have to agree with you. Honestly, when I think of Spider-Man, I think of this little kid from Queens who's just trying to do what he thinks is right. And then in the MCU, he's like, he's like Iron Man's protege. And I'm like, no, I'm like, that's not how Spider-Man is supposed to be. He's just supposed to be this guy who was like, I'm gonna make this suit with my super cool web things. And, but then the Iron Spider and just that whole nonsense, especially in Homecoming when like, Peter was, like, saving, like, the bow, and then he's like, you're not even here, and then Tony was there, and I was like, oh. That scene was gas, though. That scene was cool. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) but, 
yeah, I don't know. I just think Spider-Man, like, it's okay to have, like, a little bit of Iron Man influence, but I feel like when kind of both movies, especially Far From Home and Homecoming, are kind of, like, Iron Man-centered, it kind of loses the effect of having Peter Parker just yeah. your average Spider-Man. I personally think it's a bigger problem in Far From Home than it is in Homecoming, but mm-hmm. sticking to Homecoming real quick, sticking to things, but... Um... Absolute comedian, but anyway, <laughs> like going back to Homecoming, just I think even though Tony's influence did loom large over the MC, obviously he like kicked it all off, so it makes sense that he would loom so large. But I personally feel like this movie, it at least tried to connect back to Peter Parker in the sense that even though Vulture was wronged by Iron Man through the Avengers and what happened um, during that film. Um, he still tied it back to Peter by being Liz's dad, by being a small town crook. And then Peter, like, even though he's granted this amazing Stark suit, I feel like the best part of the movie is when he gets the suit taken away, he has to face Vulture in his, like, little onesie. Oh my gosh, the one with the bad, like, goggles (laughs) and the red and blue hoodie. And I was like, ugh. I mean, that that is good, because it shows, like, what Peter can really do. Because it's not... Because so much, like, when Tony's, like, mad at him, he, like, grounds him from the suit, right? So Peter has to, like prove his worth like that was a good part yeah. like when he had to prove his worth to iron man and show that like i am like w- like capable of being a superhero i am capable of being an avenger yes yeah. i can fight this guy with stark tech in a hoodie and not die <laughs> like and i think this also just speaks to peter parker a lot as a character yeah and i think that's a really great point you made at the end because as we were saying like our largest issue at least with spider-man in the mcu is the fact that his character feels so iron man centric but going back to his roots and the if this be my destiny scene from the comics where he's trapped under all the rubble and he lifts it up with no stark tech it's just pure spider-man just per- pure peter parker like the the what makes peter so relatable like when stan lee um wrote peter parker i, I vividly remember reading about this it was like he, he said, I'll make him have money troubles. I won't make him like the best looking dude. He'll be kind of a dork. Because he wanted Peter to be the relatable one in a world of like gods and super beings. So even though Peter is given these amazing superpowers, he still like, he still needs to ask May how to dance. Yeah, before he, still he still can't <laughs> drive. He still can't drive. He still needs to, like, and not. Obviously, no one's relating to having to lift, like, a literal building off of you. But I'm sure everyone has been um, at a place in time where they're like, dude, I don't know if I can do this right now. I don't think I have anyone to rely on. But I I want the strength, and I have the strength to get back up. Because that's the core yeah. of Spider-Man. Yeah, that's who Peter Parker is. He's this guy who just represents everything, like, we are. Because in an Endgame... We like see him interact with all these god like yeah. super, like people like especially when Captain Marvel's like hi Peter Parker yeah. and he's like takes the gauntlet like he's just this guy who just got bit by a spider when there's these literal gods such as like Thor and then there's Captain Marvel who's basically like a god yeah. right but then we just see him and it's like if Peter Parker can do that I can take this test tomorrow yeah. or I can get a job or like that kind of stuff so he i feel like in this world of like impossibilities and just like magic and everything he's the one that we can count on and be like if if i know peter parker can do this i can do it too yeah and so like overall i know you're like kind of mixed on homecoming i personally would rank it like a little higher on my overall spider-man ranking list i have a fun time with it i thought like the I feel like both of these movies are absolutely hilarious. Oh, yeah. They're but, very funny. <laughs> but I think um, the way they wrote Ned in this one, where he wasn't just comic relief, but, like, he was Peter's best friend. Like, like they were both hanging out together. When he dropped the Death Star, <laughs> my heart shattered. <laughs> I, he, oh, my goodness. Because he just didn't even think about it. He just saw Peter in the suit. He just dropped it. I was like, no. No, not the Death Star. Not the Death Star. That took, like weeks yeah so oh, nah. that was, they, they, they just had a lot of like not forced i feel like in the no way not on no way home and far from home i feel like especially with his girlfriend yeah they kind of made his humor forced but in homecoming like and then the scene at the dance when he's like monitoring yeah, the yeah, yeah. and he's like 
Oh my nah. gosh, that made me laugh so hard. He was just, like you were saying, it was organic humor. Yeah. It wasn't forced. <laughs> and I feel like they still managed a way to write him in a character because Peter wasn't just there. Like, Ned wasn't just there so the audience could, like, laugh at him. He had actual interactions with Peter in this movie. Yeah, he, he was actually, like, an important member of the team. <laughs> yeah, when you don't really get that in, like, something like A Far From Home... I also think, one last thing before we close out the homecoming segment, I think one of the best scenes in the movie is when he gets all uh, suited up in the Stark suit only to, like, go around help a lady with directions yeah. <laughs> and, like, put a bike away and do a flip on Eat them. a churro. Yeah, like, that is Spider-Man. That's Spider-Man, yeah. That's I completely agree. That's Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. But now in, in Far From Home, he goes to Europe, he goes on a school trip with his friends, and what are your thoughts overall on Far From Home? I personally like Far From Home better because the action scenes are amazing. Like, the graphics, and that's just what really elevated the movie for me. Like, that whole scene with Mysterio, right like right before Peter gets to the train, like, that was so cool. Like, I just loved seeing that because I remember in theaters just thinking, like, what is happening right now? And, like, I could relate with Peter's sense of confusion and be like, how is this man just, like, absolutely demolishing me? Like, I have no idea what's going on. And I thought that was really cool. And Mysterio as a villain was okay. Because I feel like we may have touched on this earlier. He was, he, was, he was a direct result of Tony. And I feel like they didn't even try to, like, tie it back to Peter. No, this they, one. it was completely, he was 100% a Tony Stark villain. Like, I feel like he was just, like, the guy from Iron Man 2. Who, Whiplash. Who, who got mad at Iron Man and took it out on Tony, except, and took it out on Tony, but this time, Mysterio's mad at Iron Man and had to take it out on Peter, because Tony's dead. Yeah, and Peter's basically just, like, Iron Man. Iron Man, Man reincarnate. Yeah. yeah. And, like, even that scene where Happy, at the end of the movie, is like, you don't have to be Iron Man. I was like, oh, that's good. Peter's making his own identity. But then he goes in that, like, suit chamber, and yeah. he's listening to, like, ACDC. When he called that Led Zeppelin, <laughs> and my blood boiled, I was like, how? <laughs> no, but, like, just that scene in general, it was, like, like, it was funny, but at the same time, it felt like John Watts, the director, was telling me one thing and then showing me another. Yeah. I mean, because in, like, Homecoming, we got this sense where Peter Parker literally goes around helping old ladies, like you said. And then in this one, we have him building his own Spider-Man suit via Stark technology, not creating it himself. I also feel like there are a lot... It's a lot easier to poke holes in this movie because there are a fair amount of plot holes in the sense that, like... If Peter could build any suit with that suit thing, why didn't he build an Iron Spider suit? Because that was one of the options if you, like, rewatch the movie. And I think the biggest plot hole, at least to me, right, is it's the scene where Peter gives Edith, like, the glasses to, to Mysterio. Oh my god, that is that is just a Peter Parker's, naive, like, being naive at its finest. Yeah, and I feel like even, like, obviously he didn't know that Beck would be a supervillain. And I was like, yeah, I understand that part. But how are you going to give the glasses to someone you only met, like, 20 minutes ago in terms of screen time yeah. instead of Nick Fury? Like, I understand <laughs> Iron Man giving the glasses to Peter because he's been irrational in the past. It's Iron Man. He has an ego. That's in character. Yeah, that's in character. I feel like Peter looking up to Beck maybe as even a father figure, like, it's fine. But at the same time... Nick Fury is right there. He's the one who recruited him. Yeah. I feel like if he didn't think he could handle that responsibility, that's something he would definitely give away to Nick Fury. I just think that in the absence of Iron Man, Peter was lost, obviously. He had no idea what he was doing, and then he's faced with these threats, the elementals or whatever they're called, and he just doesn't know what to do because Nick Fury can't do anything to stop him. Like, sure, he has S.H.I.E.L.D., but, like, he's not a superhero, right? So I think Peter trusted mysterio because he showed results because he did something that no one else was able to do so he looked at him at this figure where he was like this guy is way more capable than i ever will be he's like he has the right like he deserves this responsibility more than i ever could and i think that's also just peter's like lack of self-confidence and going through this hard time with iron man dying and everything so i think he needed mysterio to be there is like you can do this when I can. He's like, you can be there for the people when I can't. 
and then he went and stabbed in the back and everything. <laughs> but he he used he needed like a sense of this guy is he's good, he's capable. And I don't think he found that in Nick Fury because like he was screening Nick Fury's calls. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he trusted him because Beck got close to him in that short amount of time and like showed his worth and like they had that conversation on the like the top of the building mm-hmm. and everything. So I think he thought Mysterio was a better option. Yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't really think about it that way. Um, it does make a little more sense when you put it that way. It's still not a plot point that I'll fully ever get behind. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I, I appreciate like you trying to rationalize it because like that really does make a lot more sense when you apply it into the context of the movie. I do think though when Mysterio goes like full Bond villain like at the halfway point that's when he he becomes great because Jake Gyllenhaal just goes Jake Gyllenhaal is so funny like as soon as Peter leaves the bar he's like ladies and gentlemen we got him (laughs) (laughs) and then like that scene like you mentioned um when Nick when Peter and Mysterio fight like outside of that train station and Peter's just going in those illusions that is by far my favorite part of the movie oh yeah no it that i just remember getting lost in the theater and just being like what is happening just feeling like the sense of void and just distrust and just be like what happened like where did i go wrong and i think that's also another very important part of peter parker's character he trusts everybody when he shouldn't he is this again 16 year old boy who thinks oh Superhero, obviously very good person. Yeah. Like, that's what his mind goes to. And then after, like, this movie, and it's going to lead into No Way Home, just especially, like, shows that you can't trust everybody. Not everybody is out for the same reasons you are. Yeah, I personally think, though, like, I'm glad that they're tying the end of Far From Home back into No Way Home. I just think Peter doesn't really face any consequences in this movie. Oh, he never does. <laughs> like... And, like, like the biggest consequence he faces in this movie is in the post credit scene where Beck reveals that he's Spider-Man of the World. Yeah. That is not something that should be post credits. No, that, that should, be that should have the been movie. the end of the movie. That should yeah. have been in the movie. That is not post credits, Monsieur. Usually because that's the whole reason for No Way Home. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, like post credits are supposed to be like a fun little teaser of something a couple movies ahead. or a f- Not the next not movie. Not the plot line for the next movie. Like, I understand that they're banking on the fact that a lot of students, or not students, a lot of people might watch the post credit scene, but still, that's a major development. Yeah, because imagine you just went home. Like, you're like, oh, the movie's over, and, like, you've never seen, like, you just went home, and then everyone's like, do you see the end credits scene? You're like, no, they're like, it's the plot of the next movie, movie. and you're like, what? But I also think Marvel did that so they could, like, ensure viewership and stuff, but it's just annoying. It doesn't make sense. (laughs) No. And on top of that, like, you know... In the first movie, like, in Homecoming, when Ned drops the Death Star, he's like, does May know? And then Peter's like, no, if May knows, he's going to kill me. And then in this movie, she's using him to fundraise, and she absolutely doesn't care that he's running around in a suit, risking his life, and instead is just letting him do whatever he wants. Yeah, they never, the only time we, like, had May find out, like, the when, when she found out he was Spider-Man, in the, like, at the end and of... Cur- and was it an end credit scene? Yeah, I think it was like, it was either a post credit scene or it was literally the very end. Oh no, it was the very end of the movie. You're yeah, right. it was the very end of the movie. Like maybe there was like, oh, Spider Man, and then it cuts to May. When that's how suit. it should. That's, that's how, how it this should have been, been because that was funny, and I was like, ha, and I laughed. <laughs> but that's how it should have been for when Mysterio was like, Peter Parker is Spider Man. But that also didn't go anywhere. I feel like like there was so much dramatic potential. Like, May is so underutilized in these movies, which is really upsetting because I'm glad we have Ned, like, as a character for Peter to talk to, but I feel like Peter doesn't really talk to May in these movies. No, yeah. Like, the most amount of character development he goes through as a result of another character, I feel like, that's on his side, is he has a heart to heart with Happy. And I like that. Not his... But aunt who he's related to who took care of him after his parents died who was there with him after uncle ben died speaking of uncle ben i have i'm glad the mcu like has like a large roster of characters that they can tie into peter parker's life but i think that removing core attributes of the character in order to shove him into the mcu should not happen like regardless like if you want to have spider-man in these movies that's fine 
And we don't, like we said earlier, we don't need the death of Uncle Ben. But Peter does not mention Uncle Ben once in these yeah. movies. I think maybe like once in like the beginning of Homecoming and that was like it. I don't even like remember. Yeah. Like, he used to, he was like a main part. Like like you said, he was a core part of Peter. He was like the reason why Peter like took Become to the streets Spider-Man. and started fighting these like low time crooks because Uncle Ben was shot. Right? So the fact that he's just like never mentioned him is interesting and a weird choice on marvel's part (laughs) yeah i think like if like you can't eliminate the entire motivation for a superhero and expect him to stand on two feet and you can't like i have no problem with iron man being a mentor to peter or even happy being a mentor to peter but for them to have more prominence in his life than the two people who raised him being May and Ben, that just doesn't feel realistic. Yeah, because I feel like what the MCU did is they kind of just, like, brushed over Uncle Ben and said the reason Spider, like, Peter is, like, working with the Avengers that's because Iron Man recruited him. Like, Uncle Ben had nothing to do with it. It's all just Tony Stark. And it's like, well, no. (laughs) (laughs) And it's cool that, like, we're getting these interactions. I know, I, I hope we're not coming off as, like, pretentious in this aspect. Yeah. We are. We're really excited that Peter is able to interact with our favorite characters. It's just, I personally wish that he stood on his own two feet as a character and wasn't so reliant yeah. on everyone I else know. around him. I feel like it's, this is what's going to be good about No Way Home. We're going to get, we're going to see Peter finally face some consequences which he's been avoiding for so long he got dr strange to bail him out of this mess which created an even bigger mess and it was all because he couldn't handle people knowing he was spider-man and i love that so much i love i saw these fan theories when the first trailer came out that dr strange was actually like a comic book villain named mephisto in disguise yeah and like that's why it was messed up but i I don't like that. I like the idea that Peter, like, totally messes up the entire multiverse because of his selfishness. Yeah. Because that feels in character in character for this universe of Spider-Man because he hasn't faced any consequences. Exactly. So, so far we've seen Peter just get away with basically doing whatever he wants. And this time he's like, I want everyone to forget I'm Spider-Man. And then Steven's like, okay, and he does it, and then it goes wrong, and he was like, this is your fault, Peter. He's like, you brought all of these people into this universe, he's like, you gotta fix it. And Peter's like, I don't think I will. (laughs) He's like, but I can. He's like, you will have to. And I think my favorite part about that is, like, you see this snippet in the trailer that's like, they all die facing Spider-Man, it's their fate. And you see that snippet of, like, Peter trying to fight back against Doctor Strange. I like the idea that Peter Parker wants to rescue these villains instead of letting them, like, just die. You know what I mean? Because... That's very in character for this universe of Spider-Man. And just any Spider-Man in general believing in the power of redemption. You look at something like the original Spider-Man 3, which I know is very maligned, but you look at that movie, and Sandman, at the end of that movie, he's not the bad guy. Peter forgives him despite him murdering Uncle Ben. Peter is very, like... He believes in the power of redemption. He believes in the power of forgiveness and second chances. And I think that having that moment for him, even in just the trailers, was such a breath of fresh air when we've had so many deviations from his source material in the other films. I do I do feel like, though, eventually he's going to have to make a choice because, though, unfortunately, the world can't all be like puppies and kitties yeah. for Peter Parker. So I feel like... He's going to face a choice in this movie where he's going to have to do something he may not necessarily agree with or especially not like, but it's going to have to be done to fix it. I feel like he's especially going to struggle with, do I save these people or do I save the billions of others that I just caused for the op- for like opening the multiverse? Yeah, and it ties back to that line in Civil War where like Captain America's comforting one and he's like, you can't save everyone. I feel like in the other movies, right, like in Homecoming, when during the Washington Monument scene, nobody dies. Yeah. During like the bank robbery where like a shop is destroyed with a laser yeah. gun, no one dies. Um, far from home, that bridge scene, no, no one, one dies. dies. Like he faces no real consequences at all yeah. in any of these movies. And to finally see him like having to make tough decisions and maybe not get the best results. Best results. Or the yeah, because. Yeah. <laughs> That's an exciting possibility, and I'm glad that they're tying it back into the roots of Spider-Man. Yeah, because this is going to be a question of who Peter is. Like, 
he the whole world found out he was Spider-Man and he took that away and he caused this madness. How is he like how, what is he going to do to fix it and how is that going to affect him just like as a character and like mentally and just like going through this whole roller coaster that he will be going through. I think I'm glad that they're finally putting the spotlight on Peter's character like growing by himself, but I feel like not only will Strange have an impact on his character growth, so will the villains. Oh yeah. And oh my god, are there villains? <laughs> oh my god, have you seen that one thing where it's like the Green Goblins talking to Peter and I'm just like ah! Yeah, like at the I think it's like the second half of the trailer is something like I, I, I forget the exact words, but it feels like Goblin is going to be like an absolute menace in this movie. And, and maybe... I'm here for it. <laughs> I am here for it. I am ready. Yeah, like there's crazy fan theories out there, which obviously I don't want to like, I don't want to say anything yet because um, like in case they're like actually true leaks, I don't want to accidentally spoil anything for the mo- uh, anyone watching. But I feel like if Norman Osborn like ends up killing someone in this movie that Peter's close to, I will be like obviously I'll be sad that they died, but at the same time I'll be like, yeah, Peter faces consequences. Yeah, like my biggest concern going to this movie is that Peter isn't like I don't know. I've I've always had a problem with not facing him not getting any reparations for anything he's ever done. So this movie I'm like, he better face something or they just wasted two like and a half hours of my life. Like something bad better happen because like he needs that reality check he needs green goblin right because like you said norman osborne's just gonna be an absolute menace menace. like that scene in like the original spider-man when he literally blows up may's house like that That was was a consequence yeah and peter doesn't know what that's like yeah so it's gonna be good to have like a hardcore villain who's willing to do the bad stuff to get Peter to finally face consequences and take action up against that. And I know Norm is just one example, but I think the coolest thing about Spider-Man villains in general is they're not all just these crazy menaces or anything. Like, they're just real people who got involved in wrong circumstances. And I think the two best, well, there are actually so many examples of this, but I think the way that they're showing Electro as just this dude in, like, this dark armor who's like, I didn't ask for this. You don't want me to be in this mess. Like, his, like, Electro's beef, Jamie Foxx actually said it in a villains panel. He was like, you know, Norman, it's a very personal beef between him and Peter because, like, he, like Peter and Harry are very, be- like, close best friends and yeah. they've been beefing for, like, year. Like, that's a very personal beef. But Electro, Jamie Foxx said, like, he feels wrong by the world. He feels like the world did him wrong. And he's less trying to like get revenge on it, it seems like, from the trailers. He just wants a way out. Yeah, because he was just this guy working in this plant. And then he just falls into a tub. And no one cares. Yeah. Like, that's just the true essence of, like, the world doesn't care about you. Because he literally almost died and no one said anything. And, like, the only person who showed him any attention was Spider-Man. All he did was save his life. And that made such a big impact on him. I feel like as much hate as people like to put on the Amazing Spider-Man franchise. And I know there was a lot of studio involvement as for the reasons, like, why those movies turned out the way they did. I feel like what they did extremely well was humanizing all of their characters. And they did that extremely well with Electro. I look forward to seeing that in this movie. And another one, I know I mentioned it before, um, is Sandman. I hope he's not just this big CGI monster who's there as another thing for Peter to fight. And I want these villains to be characters. I feel like we've seen that a lot in the trailers, especially with Doc Ock. Like, Zendaya literally is, like, making fun of his name in the trailer. So I feel like him just, like, fighting them is going to be, like, a part of it. But I also feel like him seeing what these other universe Spider-Men have done to these villains, like, seeing how Toby messed with Doc Ock and how um, Andrew Garfield messed with both Electro and, like, Lizard. So I feel like it's going to be good for Peter to hear, like, these villains, like, this is what Spider-Man did to me, and he's like, and I'm pissed. (laughs) And I think, like, on top of, it's cool that you mentioned that Spider-Man has had an impact on each of these villains' lives, but I think it's even cooler, like, these villains, obviously, they're in this movie to exploit our nostalgia, let's be honest. Yeah. But I really (laughs) want them to be, like, characters, and Otto, who I've always felt is one of the most dynamic, like, 
comic book villains, let alone Spider-Man villains. I feel like he seems to be less an outright villain from what the trailers are showing us and more of like an anti-hero. And I think that complexity, especially in a Spider-Man story, has been really lacking up to this point within the MCU. Oh, yeah, 100%. So I think it'll be cool to get Ock maybe being on Peter's side and still destroying that god-awful Iron Spider. Okay, that's that's half a lot. I do like the look of the Iron Spider (laughs) suit. I think it's cool. It's just... I just don't think it's Peter. Yeah. I think it's... Tony being like, here you go, Peter. Here's a trillion just dollar suit. suit that you can just have t- for fun. Yeah. Just take it for fun. But that scene when they both like unfold like their tentacles or like this the legs or whatever yeah. it's called that he and Doc Ock is like, really? And then like Doc Ock like smashes apart Peter suit and it looks like the nanobots are actually sticking to it. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool to me. Uh, I'm really excited. To, to see that. I know you did mention like Zendaya making fun of like Ox legs and that honestly leads me to my other biggest worry about this movie and that's I'm worried that they're gonna try to make it so quote unquote lighthearted that they're gonna oversaturate the movie with just jokes and there's yeah, gonna be no I, emotional weight. I've, I've never had a personal attachment to Zendaya's MJ in the MCU. I've She's had some good moments, but I just feel like overall she's not my favorite. And in this movie, if they try to use her as like comic relief to try to like make Peter be like, oh, don't worry about Peter, you can do anything you yeah. want. Like, that's gonna annoy me. I mean, like, she had in the past movie, she's like, oh, I figured out you're Spider Man. And she's just been kind of like satirical and just yeah. been like, not, oh, like, you can't read her character very well. But from what I can see in this trailer, she kind of seems like the basic girlfriend. Yeah, like Mich- like MJ, obviously she's not Mary Jane in this continuity, she's yeah. Michelle Jones, because again, they want to be different, yeah. but like, I still think that um, Peter and MJ, Tom and Zendaya have a wonderful chemistry with each other, oh, 100%. but I don't think chemistry is an excuse for like, not writing her character well. Yeah, they're like, oh, you <laughs> can just interact with Tom, they're like, you know how to do that, and I'm like, she needs to she do needs like other stuff. She, she, <laughs> I feel like, I don't know. We we also see that scene where he's like reaching out to save her, right? I feel like she could save herself. <laughs> like that would be on point for this MJ. Like she doesn't need Peter to save her. She can like catch onto a thing by herself. I guess something. there were a lot of like reasons. I think that scene parallels like the night Gwen Stacy died. I yeah. think they did that scene. As a parallel to that, and I respect that. I just think. I, I just think it's still not, it's not in character for her. I guess. Like she's not the type of person. She's not a damsel in distress. No, she doesn't need Spider Man yeah. to save her, and I don't think she's ever like like willingly put herself in a situation where she has to be like in the middle of the firefight. Like obviously, that one scene in the Washington Monument, that was one hundred percent purely accidental. Like she never would have like gone in there to willingly like help Spider. She's the type. I feel like she's the type of person who would like see danger and be like no and go in the other direction. Yeah. So I feel like it's. I'm gonna be curious how they see they put her in that situation because she's just not that type of person. Obviously, we're just speculating based yeah. on the trail. There's no real judgment past here because we don't know the context for no, it. Obviously it's just not. this is all theorizing, <laughs> and um, I feel like I feel like not only does the humor come from Zendaya, I feel like everyone in the MCU just tries to be like a quip machine, whether it works or yeah, not. Yeah, it's in character or not. Yeah, yeah. and like not all the jokes are written well like i thought the scooby doopy this crap moment from the trailer was really late i was like this is so unnecessary yeah i'm like would i feel like steven would say that though yeah i feel like steven would say it's just like like why you know what i mean like what did it obviously it was just a trailer moment they had to throw it in there but i just i don't want this movie to compromise storytelling for another light-hearted adventure yeah that that is a very valid concern. <laughs> this isn't, like, Peter isn't, like, having fun, a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man anymore. Like, the world knows his identity. Like, he came out of Far From Home, um, and he came out of Endgame. Like, Iron Man is that life is, he's growing up. And I want that to be reflected not only in his character, but also his tone. I think, obviously, this is a completely separate set. But I think one franchise that did this really well is actually Harry Potter. Because when you start out, like, it's very whimsical, like, Chamber of Secrets, even though there are dark moments, like, it's very whimsical, lighthearted, like, 
very fish out of water moment but as the movies progress you can see the tone gets grimmer we grow up with the characters yeah i feel like and especially <clears throat> with harry potter like there's the one turning point in the yeah. movie where voldemort is back that needs to be peter had his identity revealed like what harry potter did with voldemort like coming back to life spider-man needs to do with peter getting his identity revealed and like it can't always be fun and jokes anymore it needs yeah. to be at one point he buckles down and be like this is really happening, and I need to do something about it. Well, I think that's all the time we have for this episode of the Chronicast. Lydia, thank you so much for coming no, on. thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. I had a great time. Please be sure to check out our other podcasts, which will be in the description box below. And this is Adithya Thiag signing off. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Croncast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to be notified when our next episode goes live, please be sure to follow us on all of our social medias as well as hitting the subscribe button. In addition, if you want to check out our other podcast, The Interview by Alex Derisel, a link will be provided in the description box below. We hope you'll choose to join us again on the next episode.